entitled uh, DACA, Planning for Equitable Futures. Uh, and this is being put on uh, by Rahul Abdin, who is a graduate from DPU from uh, fairly recently. And uh, so very happy that, that, you, that you put this together. Uh, Rahul is very good. I think we'll enjoy the evening. Um, the, the title of, or sorry, this, the context of this discussion this evening is around the, the Rana Plaza factory collapse that happened at the end of April, uh, on April 24th. And as Rupal puts it, this has opened up a space for policy debate and new regulatory frameworks for the construction industry in Bangladesh. So what we want to discuss tonight is the real and very present issues affecting cities in general, namely unregulated building and planning and the impact that it has on city dwellers. Um, I will moderate the discussion uh, and try to contextualize the problems of DACA from a global perspective. Uh, and then the panel will look at the many complexities that DACA, cities like DACA face in trying to achieve a more equitable future for its dwellers. Um, architect Nazmas uh, Saqib Chowdhury will uh, present second, second, yeah. I uh, will make a presentation on the issues currently besieging urban centers from a practitioner's perspective in Bangladesh. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Ahmedula of the Brick Lane Circle will discuss the role often played by the diaspora in such crises as this factory collapse. And Rahul Abdid will present a proposal for a toolbox which looks to help with mapping and developing an accessible database for city dwellers. So what I'll ask is if the presenters can sort of uh, when when you start when you start to present, you could introduce yourself more in depth. Um, and ju I'll just say this: we're we're sitting here. For those of you who don't know uh, DPU, we're sitting here in what's called uh, the Bartlett Development Planning Unit, and we are um, one of the departments of the the Bartlett Faculty of the Built Environment, which is architecture, planning, construction management, um, and other schools and DPU uh, and we mainly focus on issues affecting cities in rapidly growing region in developing countries the global south uh, what, whatever uh, sort of name you want to call it and not to be not to generalize the issues in cities uh, you know across the global south not to say that they're the same at all um, but this is what we focus on mostly we do a lot of masters programs with a PhD around these issues so our building. Welcome. Um, you can read our new regular, most recent news that you So I'd just like to give a sort of quite short contextual some ideas on a global perspective on what I think are some of the things impacting uh, on DACA. Um, I can't say that I'm, a, I'm a very knowledgeable about DACA, but I have done some work there in the past. We've done, I've been working with a couple of um, different people uh, in DACA. Um, and we have quite closely with some of them looking at issues around climate change adaptation, how people live, building and construction, um, and things like that. So I've done a little bit of work there. Uh, I've been in Dhaka, and um, so I'd like to just give it a bit of a, a bit of a global context. I won't talk too much about Dhaka because obviously there's people who know much more. But what I just wanted to say was that what we see in countries around the world is that the percentage of labor in industry and service, the percentage of labor in industry and services has been steadily increasing. So we see an increase over the years of both the percentage of labor force not working in agriculture, but working in industry and services. And this is quite well correlated with the level of urbanization also. So we see across the world a major growth in both the labor force working in cities and working in industry and services. And also with a, a small present growth in the GDP, also from industry and services. So this is really uh, a growth kind of pressure, growth kind of industry and economy that's putting pressure on urban development <coughs> in cities. Uh, and this is happening around the world. If we look specifically in the Bangladesh context, for example, the ready-made garment industries are, are said to be more than 70% of the country's net exports. Um, and from what I understand, the number of enterprises rose in the garment industry rose from 30 in 1980 to about 5,150 in 2010 and 2011 fiscal year in Bangladesh. 
and many, most of this is in Dhaka. So we see a, a very large amount of the country's um, exports and development, and all of this being concentrated on Dhaka. And so the questions sort of come um, as to sort of larger questions about planning and construction. So all of this building, in this, all of this um, investments in the garment industry, in uh, manufacturing, etc., require land, they require buildings, they require people, they require all the services um, that support these things, and essentially are urban functions. And so the questions who I thought that, that I thought we could try to look at tonight is how does the process of planning and construction influence social and spatial justice? I mean, there's certainly who builds and who controls building. There is certainly a locus of power in the way that cities are uh, constructed, and certainly I think as we'll see tonight in, in Dhaka, this is very true, right? Um, and we'll look more at that. And also, who has access to information? Who has access to what is a safe building? Who has access to information about um, construction safety standards? Who has access to information about where are flood risks? Where is earthquake risk? Who has access to information um, about who owns and who controls land, for example? And this is really often, um, often in the hands of very few people. Who generates this kind of information? And I think this is something Rahul has been working on, is who generates information about building safety? Who generates information about, about where, where risks, where people are vulnerable, et cetera, et cetera? And who generates this information also impacts the power. So I think that the idea is that, you know, that in the, uh, cities such as Dhaka, if we try to, you know, if, if people, if masses of people have more access to information, this could, try to, this could potentially change things. Um, just to show from another perspective, I've recently done a work um, for this, the UNISDR Global Assessment Report, um, which was, and this report, which I have here, is looking at how the private sector influences disaster risks. So how how hazards such as earthquakes, floods, etc., are influenced by investments in the private sector. And we did a paper looking at private sector investment decisions in building and construction. Uh, and we had a case from Dhaka, Bangladesh, which was done by uh, my colleague, Herrera Jabin. Um, uh, and so, uh, what we looked at in this are our private sector investments in building and construction increasing levels of disaster risks. What are the causes behind this? What does this mean for governments or other sectors of society who bear the burden of this kind of risk on them, like people who are working in factories, etc.? Um, how and so, and we looked at um, the regulatory environment around land use planning, etc. Uh, and what I mean by the private sector in building and construction is real estate developers who are building housing, who are building commercial premises, companies that are building for their own productive purposes, factories, production plants, office buildings, commercial premises, etc. Plus, I think it's cut off on the slide here, but plus all of the architects, planners, engineers, building construction sector are also part of this private sector that does building and construction. Um, and so, we were trying to look at how these people actually influence what is being built and what this means for flood for people at flood risk, building collapse, earthquake risk, etc. Um, and I won't go into a lot of detail about the outcomes of that, but it was essentially looking at these four countries plus literature, etc. And what, what we came to the conclusion was that um, there are many, and if you look at these sort of small text around there are many different influences about uh, influences on this urban construction environment. Um, and so the urban construction environment being speculative development that's built by developers, etc., um, businesses or productive services, um, individual housing, whether it's built formally or informally, or public or private infrastructure services, um, that these are part of the urban construction environment. But there's actually a lot of things that influence this urban construction environment. Um, there are investment of funds, both from banks or from private capital. And these, where people want to invest, will also influence how cities are built. 
Um, in some countries, there's insurance that will influence. In some countries, landowners. I mean, landowners have a lot of power and a lot of uh, say over what is built where for in a city, for example. Uh, building regulations will impact, or maybe more or less in some cases. Um, market pressures, media, environmental groups, advocacy, people's preferences, civil society, these can also put pressure and influence on how and where construction happens. Uh, building professionals, such as architects, engineers, surveyors, and in some cases planning, partnerships with local governments and land use regulations, this whole regulatory framework, will also influence um, the construction in the, in the uh, urban environment. Um, so, I'll, I'm going to leave it at that, and I'll leave it, open it up to everyone else. Uh, we can have a discussion after, but essentially just saying there, there are many sort of influences, and if you look at what's happening in Dhaka, I think we'll see some more of this. Um, uh, let me introduce myself first. Um, I'm Nazim Sakhtar, and I am basically graduate from Brack University in Dhaka, and there after graduating over here, I came in uh, to study about the rapid change and space resources, which is basically uh, more about learning uh, the built environment, it, which has developed more people in the world, and developing countries as well. And after that, um, we have, I and Ruhu, we have set up a branch of our farm, which works for the development of the built environment for the different communities. Um, today, I'm going to talk more about uh, the construction sector uh, in Bangladesh. The construction sector is basically uh, pretty much big uh, as a whole, and there are also a few players, as Cassidy has already said. Uh, but I'm going to talk more about uh, the people who are involved with this construction sector, uh, both experts and the key players who are uh, who influences over here, and how actually they work. So how the government works in place of circulation and how the private sector works in order and what actually happens on the ground. Before we go for that, I think we need to understand what Bangladesh is. Uh, more or less everybody knows about it, but this is a basic information. The country's been uh, basically a major delta area, so it's a, bit, it's a more of a flat plain land uh, with some of the variations that we can see on the this part of the region with the great forest areas and mostly these are flat plains surrounded by India on both three sides. Um, of course it is a density population area as we can see the population density is around um, 1033 going to this part the uh, ninth in the whole world. Um, okay. Um, the mostly the country is yeah, it has a uh, six division uh, area. So the Dhaka is a capital city, and then you have six different divisions. Sorry, let me just go. Sorry. So these are the major divisions all around the Dhaka city area, and each division has its own city, city center. And then each division, I mean, all the divisions collectively have more 64 districts. Uh, it's been separated as districts, areas. And then uh, the sub districts, Indian, and villages come into place. So this is basically the overall hierarchy of the geographical uh, situation in Bangladesh. And what does these uh, divisions produce? So Dhaka as a capital city is there. And then you have the divisional cities on each division. So Kumla has one city, uh, Rajshari has its own cities, uh, uh, Silak has its own cities. So these are all small and big cities that are there. And then these cities have, each division have its own cities as well. So each 64 dis, uh, divisions have 64 cities, small uh, or town actually basically, it's not as all as cities. And then the sub districts have its own town. And then the villages are spread out. Oh. And what are the administration uh, looks into place? How administration takes uh, its regulations towards that? So you have Rajput, Rajputins, uh, Rajasthani Unnoyan Corporation, it's a Bengali, the uh, It's more about uh, 
for the development of the capital city in Dhaka. It works for the development. So uh, it, it is uh, more or less, more or less uh, so whenever a person goes for a planning permission, that you have a city, you have councils over here, uh, but city hall actually takes a more overall planning things in London. But Rajuk is, is more of a kind of a city hall uh, place you know, over here, but it looks about the overall, uh, so whenever a, a planning permission takes in place, go to Rajuk for your permissions. Any kind of building that takes place, any more formal building that takes place. And, but the uh, city corporation is also there. So you have a like, a city corporation, but uh, it's more about taking care of the cities of the services that it provides to take care of the city. And you have city corporation on each divisional cities. Uh, so uh, if you go outside Dhaka to, uh, to build any kind of uh, planning or buildings uh, in these cities, Rajshay city or Pune cities or Silla cities, you go to the city, city corporation for its permission. And if you go beyond that, in those towns, uh, Union Parishad, you go for Union Parishad to do that. And LGRD is Local Government and Rural Development. So it is uh, mainly an uh, overall, it's, it's basically what you say is uh, the ministry of the government who takes care of this good development and development. So any kind of infrastructure that takes place or any kind of services that takes place, any kind of plan planning that takes place, it's all under LGRD. Uh, and so more or less this one is, but as you can see that the unions, unions is more of a kind of a geographical boundary, but it doesn't have any administration uh, boundaries for the building uh, as much as building is concerned. So union and villages are left out of this whole area. So if you want to build any kind of building, or schools or, or flood shelters or anything else, you don't need to have a planning permission from to go to. And so besides that, so what are the rules and regulations of the construction sector? So initially it was in 1952, uh, which have, government has initiated the Building Construction Act. And the first draft of BNBC, BNBC is Bangladesh National Building Code. Uh, it's been done in 1993, the first draft was made, and it is basically an accumul accumulation of uh, British uh, building code and American building code. So I don't know how that accumulation has taken place, but it is basically a mixture of those two standards. And over here, it is written more of a kind of like fire safety hazards, uh, what will be the uh, construction, like. Uh, concrete, uh, what will be the mixture of the concrete, uh, it's more of a kind of very technical perspective these rules and regulations have taken into place, right? Uh, spatial uh, regulations is missing from PNBC. So it doesn't have like very probably the minimum room size for individual habitat to take space. So those kind of things are missing from PNBC. And then there is an amendment to PNBC, uh, only to one clause stating that whatever uh, the government puts in place of rules and regulations regarding building, that becomes sort of law to be abided by the citizens. Uh, do you understand what I mean? So it's more like previously whatever stated in BNBC is not, uh, people don't actually have to be abided by that. So because that is not a law, that is actually basically a, um, what should you say, a guideline for building construction, something like that. Okay, sorry? Like a standard. Yeah, just like a standard. And after that, uh, the first female uh, Nirman Bindimala came into place. This is Bengali terms, uh, which means uh, building regulation. Yeah, building regulations. Yes, <laughs> better box to say uh, term for that. And that happens in 2008. Now, what is the difference between uh, these two laws? That this is basically a major shift because previously the regulation was something like how much space that you have to leave in front of the uh, front of your building and on the back, back here, and on the both side. So there is a fixed um, fixed open space that you have to place your building in, so the building will get the more or less at the center. And it also states about how many stories that you can uh, build on top. And the number of stories are uh, basically guided by the, uh, you know, that, what you say, um, so here, Air Force, not, not Air Force, but civil aviation rules and regulations. So it depends on the airport itself and the, and the, and the um, what you say, 
the areas that goes along. So the more you go away from the center of the airport, the higher the buildings will be. So that, that's basically the guiding principles for going on top. Uh, but later on, this this environment came into place. Uh, it is the first initiation of FAR, say floor area ratio. So a specific ratio has been taken into place, and where they stated that no matter how higher you go, so the more you leave the ground area coverage, the higher you can go. Does it make any sense? Yeah. So uh, something like that. So, but that height has also been. Uh, regulated by uh, by the you know, uh, civil aviation authority as well, which is uh, in case of the information, this is missing because uh, when you, when somebody goes to Raju and says I want to, I want to have an extra building, it's, uh, Raju says you can have that, or Raju says okay I will allow you, but Raju never says that where it is the um, the citizens don't get the map where it's been stated that what is the civil aviation's uh, mapping principle is. So, so sometimes it happens that just by the two, uh, two plots away, you have a building which is like 30 feet, uh, 13 story high, and the next plot, the project won't give you the permission for making it even a six story. So something, though those kind of misconduct have just due to uh, missing of the information. Or, yeah. So anyways, so that thing happened in 2008, uh, which is a major shift. And then on 2010, the some, uh, some of the uh, amendments have taken place basically on the fire safety rules and regulations because between this period of time, I think some of the accidents have happened in the government sector. Uh, they were more on fire related issues. So they have changed uh, some uh, laws, rules and regulations just to this time. So now this is the more of a like a Frame, uh, frame that has been uh, that that's, that that's from the government perspective. Now, what actually happens on the ground? Uh, this is the thing that I'm going to explain now. Is that one is the formal sector that takes into place, and what is that? It's, it's much more similar to what happens in UK as well. So you have architects, you have civil engineers, you have this whole level of expertise that goes along, and you have the developers uh, who is actually basically construction. Uh, companies who come. So whenever a person are willing to make any kind of building, so own plot, or, or developer uh, involved, so what happens is they go to architects, mostly like over here, they go to architects, they plan out the buildings according to this and they place the permission, place this permission to uh, the Raja or the city corporations of individual divisions. And after <coughs> the permit, give the permissions, they start to build the whole building up. That is a formal sector. Now what happened to the informal sector? The informal sector is basically built up on a few. So the informal sector is basically on uh, at various level. One is at the village level. What happened at the village areas is that so, so what happened in the village areas is that uh, basically, uh, there are construction team. It's very primitive, uh, uh, primitive ways of doing stuff. Is that there is a construction team? Uh, either you, if you go for um, more of a natural material, which is the vertical architecture, if you want to, uh, so there is a separate construction team. And there, if you want to go for uh, more of a structural uh, engineering buildings kind of form, so there is another uh, construction team for that. Which, have, uh, which is basically out of grid, uh, grid system. And these construction teams are headed by a contractor, and they you actually hand over to these contractors. And more or less constructors are basically a businessman, rather they are not a technical, uh, a technical person, a technical know-how. And as you have seen from the previous slides that there is no such rules or guide regulations on taking place of any permission method that takes place. So, Basically, anybody and anybody can build a two-story or three-story, whatever story you feel like to build in in a village areas and in areas. Uh, there's an interesting observation is that now um, what there is a missing uh, from, um, is that like people are moving more over to outside abroad for work, and they are sending remittance to back to Bangladesh. Uh, previously, it happens more of the people who came into UK and USA, 
States, but it is now been uh, more been spread out to Middle East, especially on Middle East or Malaysia or Indonesia or Australia on those areas. So these these are the people who came up from these village areas, and they send their money back home. And the first thing they do is acquire land and to make up as big house as much as big as possible. And we have seen one observation, I think Elliot has gone as well, is that how, how the building itself is actually a, a, a reflection of the status that individual family have in these villages. So without plant rules and regulation, proper rules and regulation, and any kind of, there is a greater deal of damage that has already taken place in the building environment sector. And what, there is a threshold between a formal and informal areas, and this is a very keen uh, areas to understand, to understand what, what happens to Rana Plaza. Okay. This informal sector uh, is associated with the, with the people who have uh, graduated their diploma degrees. Diploma over in Bangladesh and diploma over here in UK is pretty much, is a, there is a difference to it. Uh, the diploma over here is much, of, as, as far as I understand, that is much of an undergraduate degree level. So you pass uh, your A level and then you go for your diploma, right? But in, in Bangladesh, what happens is that people who have done a good result in an intermediate level, that is equivalent to A level, they go, and those who can afford it, they go to universities for their bachelor degree. Okay? And the other, others, there is a section who don't want to go back to any kind of uh, odd job, but they want to go for any kind of professional one. So they go for uh, these diploma degrees in polytechnic institutes. And they have these civil engineers, they're being kind of civil engineers, architects. So there are architects who are graduated from, say, a polytechnic institute, and they are also known as architects. IB is now working on IEB. IEB is actually Institute of Architect Bangladesh, and IEB is Institute of Engineering in Bangladesh. They are now working on protecting this name, architects and engineers, just like RBA over here that they are doing. But the thing is, this thing happens. So what they do is because of their less knowledge of what actually construction method and technology is, and also a corruption, greater deal of corruption, what they do is that they don't follow the minimum standards that should be followed as a guideline. So say, for example, um, if you have a column that needs to be like six uh, reinfor or reinforcement bars needs to be take taking place, the standard building is, they will omit one or two reinforcement bar from it. So it reduces the cost first for the uh, client's basis. And what client sees is that, okay, I go to this person who is a diploma engineer, but he is give, handing me a, a building which is less cost than the building that, that I've taken from a, from a graduate engineer. So which one I will build? From a client's perspective, I will of course go for that. And they, these, are, so these are the things that is taking place uh, at the professional level. And then of course uh, there is a great deal of uh, this construction team that I've taken, I've, um, I was telling you previously that goes in the village areas who are basically contractors, uh, they, they do buildings or they, uh, they design buildings from their uh, previous practices. So suppose say uh, some, some guy have made a building of column which is like 12 inches by 12 inches in damage, uh, dimension of each column. And then what they do is that they say, okay, I made that column, which is the engineer have said it to be 12 inches by 12 inches, and it stands. But I have taken some rock, some reinforcement bar. I have mixed with more sand, sand marker ratio. So the more sand cement ratio is I have actually increased more sand rather than cement, and the building sticks is still there. So then he himself set the standard of what he has practiced beforehand, and then he said, like for example, they have done it in 12 inches by 12 inches. For the next building, they go for 11 inches by 11 inches. And that it more continues like that because they see that okay that building is standing up so why I can't just reduce the size of it make it more cheaper and may make it more uh, available to the client to make cheap buildings. This is another perspective. Of it. So what happened to Rana Plaza? Uh, there are there are many people who say different stuff of it, but the recipe for this kind of disaster to take place is basically for those construction teams who are in charge of making buildings. 
the, uh, the, the thing that we have come to learn for the Rana Plaza is that they, they have built, they have first uh, got um, permission for five or six story building and it, had, it was supposed to be a commercial space, not a place for uh, factory building in the first place. Then the owner in, uh, extended the upper stores, three more stores. <clears throat> then they placed, uh, they have placed generators, like huge generators, because there is a shortage of electricity in the country. They have placed generators not on the ground floor, they have placed it on the fifth floor, sixth floor, and eighth floor of the building. So what happened in the load calculation is that basically the engineer, whoever the engineer is, I don't know, but whoever the engineer is, they have calculated a low for a commercial building to take place on a five-story building. But then you increase the number of levels. Then you place with more loads of these heavy machineries of factories and including <coughs> those generators. And a crack had to have developed previously on the ground floor areas when the workers have then complained to the owners of saying that we don't want to go in because the huge cracks have developed inside. Then the, what the owner has done is that he has got some engineers, these diploma engineers, to come in and say that, okay, look, the, well, what you want uh, is, is this building is okay? He said, okay, yeah, the building is okay, no problem at all. The workers can go in and work over there. He said, okay. So then that morning, the people just move in to work. And when the electricity went off, the generator was started. And because of that vibration, this huge collapse of every place. So there is a serious lack of, first of all, information, uh, professional uh, ethics into practice has taken place, and of course, there are loads of other that has taken into account. And this, this complexity is well needed to be understood in the first place before we go ahead and work for a Thank you. Just say a little bit about myself. And I will uh, go through my slide. Um, my name is Mohammed Akhidullah. I don't have background in you know, planning or architecture or you know, building, construction, and so on. I think I was invited uh, by Ruth because I did an exhibition on Dhaka City uh, in, in London in 2005 uh, to celebrate 100 years of Dhaka City regaining capital status. It was uh, 1905. And, you know, uh, 2005. Um, and what I did, I went to Bangladesh uh, to do uh, research, talk to a lot of people, take photographs, and just familiarize myself with the city. I came to this country in 1973 and really didn't get a chance to spend much time in Bangladesh. Went for short holidays, uh, never met, never made any friends, only had relatives. So we got there two, three weeks maximum and eat as much as you can and then come back. But this was an opportunity in 2004 to get to know uh, the country and especially Dhaka. Because I'm, I'm from Dhaka, but I wasn't, actually I was born in the village 40 miles from Dhaka city. But coming to Dhaka was regular, you know. Spend some time, but I prefer city to the open space and, and things like that. Um, so the Dhaka city exhibition, I'm going, I'm going to take you through some slides. Then I'll talk about some problems and, and what I think <coughs> could be done. Uh, the exhibition was launched in 2005 in the City Hall when Bangladesh cricket team came to play in England. Uh, but, and then this exhibition toured uh, many places. And the last I haven't done anymore after 2010. Uh, so I'm just going to take you through some slides. Uh, now, this was one of the, like, the goals. Uh, what I try to do is like uh, one old building, slate is Salal Bakhella, built in the mid 1600s by the Mongols. And this is like uh, how that guy is sort of developing, you know, 2004. You see the map of that, it looks like somebody's head, right? Now, if you can see, but this is the old part of Dhaka. And then you have the river there. But then that is not really going the other side of the river. It's only going up north and expanding. Richer people, they're always moving out. You know, from They were here first, then they went there and then carried on. Okay. And these are you know, some buildings, uh, temples, and, and, some, and some modern 
in 2005, what was also happening, I actually found the whole thing quite inspiring because there were pockets of um, positive things happening, uh, like, you know, greening, partnership work in the private sector, small spaces were being improved, and that started to look nice. And there were some, uh, for the first time, some nice buildings were being constructed. Right, they were looking quite attractive, uh, better designed, uh, but they were really small pockets. Uh, you know Bangladesh floods, and these are some scenes from uh, flooding in 2004, August, when I was uh, there. Most of that, I think, is demolished. Uh, seriously speaking, right? 
Well, it doesn't mean uh, you know, literally you do all this. You know, you can keep some and build some. And also, you know, like uh, in the 1930s and uh, 40s, maybe uh, the nice houses were built. You know, uh, two-story, one-story um, in various parts. But most of them have been sort of uh, demolished. My father demolished his one uh, about five, six years ago. It was sad, but then the space doesn't make sense anymore. Even they have nice designer nice buildings, but then so on. Uh, so it's not that the space doesn't make sense anymore. Even they have nice design, nice buildings, and so on. Uh, but really, it's for the designers, the planners, and visionaries right, to think how they can rebuild the city because it's, it's really not livable. And as people get richer or get, uh, become exposed to uh, facilities and, 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 and know about cities in other parts of the world, you know, they will not want to live in the world. They will not want to, will not want to tolerate uh, the, the, the facility, the, the situation that exists at the moment. Uh, well, one trend that I've observed recently is that um, even, even in like five, ten years ago, some people build, say, five-story house, you know, with maybe ten flats or twelve flats or whatever, um, and they rent it out. But then developers come to them and they say, look, um, you give us this space, uh, we'll build uh, 30 flats, and you can have 15, right? So then, some houses which were only built about 10 years ago, they're being demolished now right, by you know, developers coming with, uh, with investment with money. From the owner's point of view, it makes sense because they're going to have more flats and they can take it in a more rental income. I know one of my uh, uncle, they had a really beautiful house uh, and had a pond in, in Dhaka. Uh, and so much, so many trees, obviously they filled the pond up. And they did create it and they did uh, a lot of greenery and build a you know, beautiful story house, but now they demolish everything because the developers want to use the whole land to build. So, so what I'm saying, but a lot of people are going, so a lot of houses and buildings are being demolished uh, because the developers are coming saying, look, you know, we, uh, we can give you more uh, income generation sort of uh, uh, flex uh, development. Uh, so a lot of people are going, going for that. So I think if you can develop some models which will work for the people, right, where you, know, you can um, rather than demolish one building, you know, demolish 10 or 20 uh, and, and create a nice space. But it's for planners, it's for architects, it's for designers you know, to come up with solutions. Right? Um, I think and in terms of diaspora, uh, obviously you know, now we have Bangladeshi people going all over the world. Uh, like that was the same, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, coming here, America, Europe, uh, the Middle East. Uh, so they, they're getting different ideas, you know, new ideas. Uh, and what we were told by, I think, one of your, uh, or you, you may be, is that some of the problems were also caused by early visitors to Singapore and Middle East, because they were coming in in pressure on, uh, on architects and, and designers to build what they saw in another country whether you are feeling exactly or not. So, um, so anyway, uh, uh, I think I'll leave it here in the discussion. I graduated from here last year in November. And uh, what we've been sort of doing for the last, what I've been doing last year is sort of setting up prioritization for business. We've been working with some projects. And this particular presentation should be the result of Perhaps of the Rana Plaza and the conversations I've had with Fuadan and some others. Um, Fuad, unfortunately, is in here. He's a researcher at Greenwich. Um, we're talking about what is it that we can do as practitioners from outside? What tools do we have? Um, what information and knowledge do we have that can be used potentially with, in collaboration with the people on the ground in Bangladesh to develop a toolbox or a set of tools? that potentially or hopefully stop this from happening again. And what we came up with this idea is safety concerns. It's pretty simple, people's information network. We wanted it to be really just an open source database network that anybody and everybody can use to get information that's needed for the environment. And but um So 
So we were trying to understand why these things happened and why, I guess, Rana Plaza collapsed. And I guess that's just given us a quite sort of in-depth understanding of the building construction sector for both from the governmental and sort of private sector-led understanding. But just sort of key points that we thought was like construction garments industries themselves are quite, because it's unregulated in, sort of in mass, it feels it's quite dangerous and unjust. And the collapse of Rana Plaza really then follows major Deadly fires that happened last year and, and in 2010. I mean, and what we've seen since Rana Plaza is that there's been a lot of institutions who have pushed for monitoring building regulations, which included dem demolishing or closing down factories, and also trying to monitor and collect data of the workers that are in these buildings. And what's happening? The politics is also changing as well. And along a side by side, we've got a global movement, which is which has been led by Industrial, to get brands signed with the Fire and Safety Accord. And so far, I think 50 or so brands from states here in Europe have signed up to this now so far, not including Walmart and Gap, but who want their sort of own regulation. Right. Um, at the same time, I think what Nazareth was saying in terms of what Parliament's doing is that they're trying to push through various policies and sort of show that they're actually listening to what the people and the governments are wanting. So, Currently, they're trying to push through an amendment, which is the Spanish Labour Act. But I think, I mean, I, I don't know too much about this because this was done by Quad, but um, I know that the previous one was more worker friendly, and this one is more look, looking at sort of the owners of the factories and how they, it's given them more power to sort of um, do what they want to do. And I mean, what, I, what we did do in sort of in a previous presentation was give a more contextualized history of Ben Paul and his textiles. But we probably won't do that here. Um, but you can sort of see that Ben Paul and Bangladesh has quite a rich sort of heritage of textiles falling back from the British period way back then with Muslim and the Mughals and yeah, the sort of production of cottons and silks. So it was always seen as a perfect environment for <coughs> this, um, it, was, it was seen as a perfect environment for industry to develop because a lot of these skills already existed. Um, some of the key sort of issues from structural adjustment up in, in the last 30, 40 years has shown that policy has been really focused in creating EPC zones and policy to help Bangladesh trade with US and UK and others. So it's been made friendly for outsiders to come in and trade with Bangladesh in a very, very proactive way. And this has definitely helped the country itself develop its economic activities. And our initial idea really was, so it's it quite lofty, I guess. We said we wanted it to be something that could enable the transformation of the garment sector and the factories in Bangladesh through socially just processes, which would really look at creating dialogues between the power holders, the workers, and the public. And what Ford and I were doing is how would we go about creating a practical solid solidarity um, and social surveillance of these factories. But I think what we when we presented this last month, what we understood was that it's actually more important to look at it more holistically from a local political economy perspective. And what Lazarus and I and Fuad discussed over the weekend is that actually it's more important to look at it as a sectoral thing rather than a fa factory thing, because factory is just one particular issue within the construction sector. So really if we say the idea is to look at the transformation of the construction sector in Bangladesh and then using this quite a robust socially just process and then creating these dialogues between the power holders, the workers and the public, it gives us more room to negotiate and understand what happens on the ground as well as then look at what happens at policy level as well from a more national perspective throughout the entire civil sector rather than one specific um, entity. Um, so I guess I've sort of already discussed the reasons and the objectives for this, but to sort of sum up, it's really to develop this open source database and that will allow us to train and develop people as well as tools that would potentially give us access to this information. So initially I guess it's the written, the visual, the training, the documentation that we need to do and in order to nurture this network and this database we need to really make it a rigorous exercise. So it needs to really carry the weight so that it can both be used at policy level 
and on the ground so be a tool that the government workers and construction workers, whoever maybe can use it at the same time. At the same time. So I mean we I mean we think because it's quite ambitious, but we know that it's it's possible if we really look at it in a very strategic way. So that Rana Plaza has really given us a a small room for maneuver. So we're really, it's opened a small crack for us to enter this particular dialogue. And what we're really proposing there is um, framework, I guess which we will develop in the next couple of weeks, that allows us to understand the risks from the local political point, but also then produce an, um, empirical research that allows us then to analyze and present findings that would allow us to then develop this toolbox. So I think it's, I guess in a nutshell, we want to be on the ground, we want to work with those that are already doing things, which means local government practitioners such as architects, surveyors, engineers, um, gives us the toolkits in terms of the information that we propose some things which can be taken towards policy level, local level, as well as those that potentially might not have access to it already. And I mean, it's a very simple exercise, I think, in terms of how it would be done. We know the local conditions might be sort of restricted in certain ways, but what we were thinking about is to develop a very robust methodology that allows us to survey the conditions and create sampling factors that look at the social, the economic, the political, and especially the access. Because we really need to understand how access to information is created or developed. And since Rana Plaza's collapse, we've got to really look at the structural integrity of buildings. But I think how we do that is again another conversation that we need to have. And I guess this is just a, a more robust methodology for looking at the building, the built environment itself. So from floor plans, density ratios, to how many workers potentially work in factories, to how many different businesses operate from one factory, where they supply to, whether it's local, national, international. And the building integrity, so the construction, the engineering components. And I guess one of the things that we've looked at is, where is the engineering? Where is this generator located? I mean, it seems very sort of obvious, but I guess these are things that we've got to really look at. And what really then we need to look at is the working conditions. So the lives and air qualities and how much access potentially workers get um, to breaks and perhaps whether they're allowed to work in a safe environment or not. And in order to sort of carry out this particular exercise, we thought it would be really good to focus on two or three sites. And so this so zooming in in Dhaka, but um, from the map that you saw from that's what says the map. Um, this is old Dakas here, and then sort of goes up in airports further up north. And where the accident happened was up in outside here, Shabar, which is really an EPC zone, has been created, like Shulia and some other places, to be um, for the garments industry. But um, so these three sites that we selected, one would be Sabar, and the other two would be Markali. Markali allows us to look at um, retrofit buildings, so it's a long stretch of factories on Airport Road which have been sort of retrofitted and made into factories but we don't really know whether they were originally or existing factories. And at the same time, we wanted to look at factories in Kulistan, in Bogdavaza, which really supplies the local market. So this is a completely different set of um, criteria and conditions that exist because there's no outside viewpoint of what's actually going on on the ground. And that's it really. I mean, it's quite simple, I think, but um, the idea would be to then really disseminate that information through online and to offline um, forums and spaces. So for us, really keen to look at creating an online platform where we give access to unions, architects, engineers, as well as people like ourselves here, the diaspora. And then it also allows us to put it into the hands of brands, governments, and various NGOs that are already working on the ground, and international NGOs or local NGOs. I think it also then allows us to collaborate to sort of make sure that we're not duplicating work that's already been done. So I think mean, that's pretty much it as an idea. So the idea is really to just create a sort of a safety pin.
I guess just to sum up, what we were really interested in is then trying to create a sort of a network as well as a toolbox which allows us to help people on the ground through our sort of technical expertise as well as the expertise that we can run across sort of networks. And that's probably the most important thing because we realize the access to information is missing and therefore the fact was able to collapse as well as other sort of issues that happen across Bangladesh and Dhakan. And if we're able to create this space where information can be shared, like it can potentially have a lot of influence both at policy level but also on the ground, um, that's a really good. Thank you. Um, so can I open it up to questions and comments? Yeah, I've loads of comments. Thank you for your presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, my name's Elliot Connolly. I'm uh, work working as a structural engineer in London. Um, so I know a lot about the construction industry. And I've been to Bangladesh a few times now. And uh, well, I work on as on a charity project out there. But um, main things are, it's nice to hear this. I don't know much about the construction industry in Bangladesh. But I heard that there are codes and regulations in place for buildings to be designed to. So for example, in England we have the British standards and we have Euro codes to be able to build you know, minimum standards of how to design and build a building. So at the end of the day, the engineers in Bangladesh need to work to these codes as a minimum standard. And there needs to be legislation in place that makes them stick to that and that their work is checked. And then the information is then passed on to the contractor. The contractor then builds what the engineers have stated, what needs to be built, and there needs to be legislation in place that makes them build what the engineers are saying build, and then it's built, and then you have a safe, sturdy, state stable building at the end of the day. So the key things are, like you say, information needs to be available to all. First thing is, there is information there, like you say, you need to talk to those people that made this information that, you know, come out there, merge the British codes and the American codes. Talk to those guys. Ask them questions about is there legislation? Why is this why aren't people sticking to it? Um, why is there you know, it's about the corruption side of things really, I suppose, to, to be able to stop this kind of thing from happening. Because we can have as much information as possible available to everyone. It's just <coughs> It's a question of are they going to stick to it, and uh, that's the key thing. Um, I wonder what your thoughts were on that, really, because to be able to stop this from happening is, I think, I think that's the, that's the way. Yeah. This. Yeah. Um, the thing is, like, whenever these kind of rules and regulations come into place, it's um, nothing. Um, Things also come to place. There is a great deal of um, uh, trust between the these players, and it's, it is it is much it needs to be understood um, uh, because uh, it, I mean, it is not, it is it's necessary to understand the history behind it. Is that over here or any other developed countries, the government is there to support the people. The government is there to support uh, the basic rights of the people and to say that we are not over here to rule, but over here to guide and lead. But the governments in, the, in, in, in most of the underdeveloped countries, uh, including Bangladesh, is more seen as, as more of a ruler. So it seems to be that the rules and regulation is much more not for uh, what the people see, is that rules and regulations are not for their own benefit but it is for the government to crack down or you know, to, to, to emphasize the rule that they are running on. So the thing is whenever a person goes on practicing it, these rules and regulations, they think as a binding obligation rather than or thinking like these rules and regulations are for their own safety. So this is a basic things that needs to be changed on citizen level. Uh, most of them. So the thing that Rule was saying to his presentation is that uh, gathering this information, how you gather. So whenever you go to gather any kind of information, really, then the people, will, the people who will give you the information, they want to know the story behind it. I mean, why you want this information. So we were having a discussion with them. So uh, most of them sent me on this matter is, what is actually the number of workers working on these factories? A simple number that anybody can actually say so. But this simple information you won't get it because 
well, what is the, the number of workers studying in every garments industry that has been stated in BGMEA, which is the association for this kind of owners. Uh, it's it's not what is reflected on the ground because the number of the number of workers that they have given it that based on because of based on that number specifically uh, they have to pay their own insurance the workers insurance so the the, the 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 owners have to pay you understand what I mean the complexity so the thing is like so that they 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 lower the number of implement uh, the number of workers and they're provided to the GMA because they know that that based on that particular number, they have to pay the insurance for the workers' safety. So the actual number actually get it from their own payroll uh, payroll books that they give it to, wages that they uh, from which they give it to the workers. But that information you are hard to get. And when you will go over there and you ask for this, the actual number of information, and they will say, okay, are you from a government agency? Who are you from? Like if, if you said that you were from UK, I was like, okay, is there any kind of conspiracy behind it? You know, like those these things happen because of this mistrust and and rely on each other and each parties that goes on. So the complexity is, is taking place right from the beginning of the information. And of course, the sharing of information will take place apart. If you can say that this the information that we have gathered is basically what it is on the ground. <coughs> I just want to add one thing, which is um, just sort of a friend whose who's cousin is a, basically an operations manager in one of the factories in the back And it was interesting because he was saying into the regulations of what happened. And so his cousin, he was saying his cousin has been, his role is to basically take contracts from outside. And he's been told that he's not allowed to refuse any contract, irrespective of whether it's exercise or system or like that. And it just be subcontracted out. And so even though that their factory that they have is not able to fulfill the needs of a particular order, they will outsource it to subcontract it down to another factory, which may or may not have the conditions that meet this the potential buyer's need. But obviously because it's been subcontracted out, that completely sort of well often it sort of it's it sort of takes away the responsibility from the buyer because the buyer has to contract with the contract the garments factory that they did. So that, that kind of thing is very real. He's saying even post run up last night, this is last week he had a conversation with his cousin, he's saying, well, we still have to do what we're doing. So even though this is happening, mm -hmm. he still cannot say, no, it's not safe, we can't take this order because we can't deliver it in this time. Because um, he loses his job, that's it. Yeah, that's absolutely. It. So that's maybe it. there needs to be clauses in the contracts of the big brands yeah. like New Look, Top Shop, Red Ryan, I don't know who it is, Primark, and they need to have. Clauses in the contract. Like they have to stay. Development self contract the work we give to you, and obviously the buildings need to be safe enough for people to work in. There needs to be fire regulations, structural regulations. It just needs to be a safe place to work. Yeah. Yeah, but it's obviously it should fall in the hands of the client. If the building collapses, the client should have, you know, should have managed the process of having a safe building. Yeah. So there needs to be pressure put on those guys as well. Yeah. Just to ask, uh, ask something. And you talk about corruption, corruption is one of the one of the factors. Like, just give you I want to ask you, you know, they, when they build the extra three floors in the government agency on the government check or what might have been the reason not checking out. The something. thing is that I have shown you the on the previous that Brian Brian is that how uh, so this uh, this area is basically placed or not in the city corporation areas. So it's been placed, so the Rajuk is not responsible for it. It is the union, uh, Purusha, who is uh, who is supposed to work in these um, uh, sub-district uh, sub areas. So they are the responsible guys. So there is, I mean, as if you know that uh, after this thing happened, Rajuk is blaming to that union Purusha, that union Purusha is blaming to the Rajuk that who is taking off, after looking after this. But it is a practice that these guys uh, will be good handling it over the union Purusha, union Purusha should look after this. But, I mean, most of the, uh, uh, on the real ground, the thing is, if you pay them, if they expect us some money, they will just be quiet. That's it. Practically, <laughs> how do you, so practically, how do you improve, say, fire safety of garments factory? Because uh, they do have, like, uh, tech seats and so on, but they usually lock. They're going to do this in Portugal, it's a program, and it was locked, right? 
now, you know, in Bangladesh, people uh, lock themselves in their houses. They go to real stuff because they worry about thieving and stealing. Uh, so how do you address this uh, problem practically? Well, it's in England, there's a fire standard, and you just, you just have to follow through the fire standard and make sure your building is in accordance with the fire standard. So there's, it's, it's right to start when you design a building. You can't actually build a building unless it conforms to the fire standard. So it's like, so basically it's just having that in place before the building is built. And, um, and if, if the building that is already built doesn't conform to the standard that is set, then you can't work in that building. So like you said, demolish the building and build a new one with fire standards or change the building so that it conforms to the fire standards. So having fire exits that are unlocked or you can get out from, but obviously it's a security right. issue then have it locked from the outside and obviously get out from the inside. It's compartmentalization as well. So there's a number of people in a certain compartment. If there's a fire in that compartment, they need to be able to get out of that compartment to another compartment that's fire safe fire doors, stop fire spreading, things like this. It's, it's kind of I think the point, the point that you've made, which you brought earlier, which is one that, one is that, I mean, there are regulations that are existing, but the it's issue is that the regulations are not being followed, and they're not being yeah. taken out. And this is, it's this case in Dhaka, it's the case in cities, it's the case in places all over the world like that, that we cannot, regulations do not work to regulate everything. And so I think what's interesting about the project that you're proposing here is to take that onus not only on the regulations to be able to do everything, but that this information being available to everybody, this inf having more information actually makes not the regulatory people responsible um, or only the client, but everybody responsible, everyone's knowledge, everyone's understanding, and this is what changes the dynamic. Question here, and then. Uh, I think they're coming. Questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I'm a total lay person in this, um, but just on my own observations, um, my family from Tanzania, so I'm a member of the diaspora, the Tanzanian diaspora. It's quite small in the UK, but um, in 2010 I went to Tanzania for the first time in 11 years. I went back in 2012, and again in a couple of weeks. And what I noticed in that 10 year gap was the centre of Dar es Salaam, which is the capital, transformed in 10 years. It was different. We recently had a huge building collapse right in the centre of the city, not too far from where I stayed. Now, from what I gathered, there is generally, at the moment, this huge economic boom. It's a boom in Tanzania. They just discovered more gas than they could know what to do with over the next 150 years. Now, you mentioned something about culture. That you mentioned about legal, uh, enforcement of legal requirements of such a building. Now, how do you how do you intend to tackle that? Because a process which possibly took 200 years here in the UK is happening in the next 50 in Tanzania, a lot quicker. And like I said, some just said something about you see things here and you want to build them there. And a great example of that, I saw a, about a 12-story building with a car park on possibly the sixth floor in Dar es Salaam. So the car park is in the middle of the building. Now, I'm sure you'll have your comments on that. But that was a fine example. That was something which was unthinkable five years ago, but it's now a rage in Dar es Salaam. And anyone who's been to Dar es Salaam will see that the skyscrapers are going up. But if you say to anyone, okay, fire safety, regulations, and I've heard the response is, look, we're, gonna, we're doing things our way. You know, this is our time. This is our time to seize the moment, to jump on the economic train, which is coming to the station. So how do you attempt to almost counter that? Because, you know, if I'm making a lot of money, my, my initial concern would necessarily be, well, wouldn't necessarily be safety in the sense that of doing things your way, which is maybe European standard. So how do you attempt to counter that? I think that question is too general, but. It's one of the things, I mean, what we were talking about is how do you, I think what Cassie says, this information gap that's inherent to other whole sort of developments. <coughs> Mostly in these sort of really rapidly urbanized cities, in Dhaka specifically, is because if there are certain powers that want to control and <coughs> to guide a particular process, then access to that information is then limited. So it's really trying to open up that information gap that really should be getting. That's really one of the ways we are, I think we can make a little bit of a difference. Because the more people have access to that information, the more that at least they can do something with that information. Because if, if they don't have it, there's nothing they can do. 
Uh, and that's one problem. You know. the, yeah. The, the thing is, like, the most of the other countries, I mean, they try to follow uh, what the European standard is or what the American standard is. Uh, but it is, of course, it's, it's very, um, it's important to understand that where the standards are coming from. It, it, the standards reflect the culture, the lifestyle, and, and the values that these organizations, that these countries follow. And the European Union, they, they have the common ground, they have found some common ground on these values, these uh, culture and ethics. So their, their, their rules and regulations are brought up from there. The American state is the same. So it is, it is, it is important for Tanzania, for Bangladesh, or for any other countries to understand the basic culture of the people and the understanding the values and ethics that they follow. And then the rules and regulations should reflect their process. And then it becomes, of course, these these standards from European standards or from America, these, these are for good as for to keep it as a reference. And definitely for sure that some when more I, I believe most of them can be taken into account for it. But it's also to understand that some of them doesn't clash with the culture and values because if you try to try to incorporate all these things, then it may some of them may clash or people may not understand from it. Yeah, you had a question actually, sorry. Yeah, I mean, you know, my understanding of what's happening in the Rana Plaza is, you know, to me it's a social problem, you know, because in one side you've got the landowners or the building owners, you know, they build this building, but nobody's been held accountable. They're not architect, not the civil engineer, not the owner. But it kind of like seems to me that the people that work in these buildings that have no representative at all to look after their interests properly. Uh, but what I'm kind of like saying, is, yeah, you guys are having this safety pin, and I think it's a brilliant idea. But I think everybody should have this information. But it seems like that the problem that we're going through in Bangladesh is basically a social problem. You know, you have the haves and the have nots. You know, the haves are controlling everything else. So let's say the people that are working in these factories, I mean, I'm sure if they have a choice, they wouldn't work in these buildings. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you understand? But what I'm kind of like very shocked about is, you know, like, the political parties or the government or uh, organizations such as building regulators or whatever, this actually, you know, who do you hold them? Who do you? Yes, I think that's Did you know what I mean? It's like, who do we, who do we point the finger at and say, you know, this is your fault, you make this possible. Well, yeah, that's a little bit what you were thinking. About. Yeah, I mean, well, it's this gentleman, what you're saying, he's perfectly right. But uh, one of the reasons that, mm -hmm. the reason that it can never work in that yeah. is simply because it's po po uh, poverty. Yeah, you know what I mean. Most yeah, people yeah. are struggling. Most people they have to go to work to get their wage. Yeah, so most people are like you know. I mean, most people in Dhaka, for example, they're living from day to day. Yeah. If they don't go to work for two days, three days, they're not going to eat. They can't eat. They yeah, can't exactly. feed their family. They can't do this. They can't do that. Do you understand? Totally. So the building regulation you've said and the structure that we have in Europe or developed countries is perfect in many ways, you know, and we could implement it. But I don't know how to deal with the social problem. And it's a bit like, you know, you're catching, you're like yeah, 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 yeah. I think, as everybody is saying, it's, it's not, not a simple solution to that. Uh, I'm so glad that I've been successful with the here. Um, I think there is no simple solution to that, at least as um, Google of Machine is, is like a, it's <coughs> kind of a crack, and it's, it's kind of a demonstration of what can happen in a complex situation. Uh, in kind of an open, you can say, uh, in a complex problem where you really struggle to hold who are the people behind that. And there are lots of people behind the understanding. We need to account the, uh, the civil engineers, the planners, the architects, and, and those who are behind the planning and building in the cities, either in Samar or in, in Dhaka. So there are a lot, lot of things to do.
I think this this is a very nice initiative to if you can have objective observation how was the setting of this carbon uh, cell the of sites and then kind of gather the information through crowdsourcing in the involving genus business and maybe then you can see what was the actual facts on the top and that can be another and then you can say uh, talk with the decision makers and other actors too. This is the real situation which they made us in the ground. What can we do about that? So I think that that would be a very good thing to do. I just want to put that one problem. You know, like uh, nearly everybody in Bangladesh in the city, because of uh, the situation and involving corruption in one way or another, could benefit and, and also suffers as a result. And you know, money can exchange uh, you know, to disrupt any you know uh, any uh, steps or any you know uh, robust system <coughs> set up regularly. Uh, but then you know, initiative like this can make a contribution, mm. and and you know as many other people, like what you say, doing many other things, uh, and can make incremental improvement. But knowing you know how society works, you know the business is construction. How much you know? Just a bit of money can do anything. But yeah. So it's going to be really difficult to change things very quickly. But uh, but but then there has to be a solution. We have to think and come up with something. Yes, I have yeah. a point which follows on from the issues already raised about structural integrity. Um, my name's Oliver. I studied with Nasmus at London Met, and uh, I'm an architect working in London. Um, I think the principles of making information available to the world at large, uh, the workers, everybody, is very important and very, very admirable, but it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, for example, <coughs> we were talking, this gentleman in front of me was talking about the fire uh, compartmentation and fire escape and things. Even as an architect, and I've worked on exactly this issue of adding two floors to a building and wondering whether the fire escapes can cope with it with all the extra people, I find that very hard to understand, and that's my line of work, you know. It's, it's, it's incredibly complicated, and the people who are focused on feeding their families and going to work are going to find this quite a difficult. They're not going to want to read through pages and pages and pages of, of uh, you know, stair widths and, and ratios and stuff. So um, the challenge of making it accessible to the general public is, is very interesting. Um, the other thing um, we were talking about earlier about having, you know, there are standards although it seems there are probably holes in them and they're not widespread enough. For example, in Dhaka itself, uh, there is a, an accountable organization, but outside it all starts to break down a bit and become more loose. Um, <coughs> is there a system of um, building inspectors to ensure these standards are um, adhered to? The project I'm working on at the moment is on site. <laughs> And then whatever they say is almost irrelevant because they'd be paid off. That's because right, yeah. the building owner would be like, you didn't see that, go away, give them a lump sum. So it's, it's almost, there's so many different avenues, so many different things that need to be done. And, and most of, uh, most of, like, uh, sorry, one thing is that the building regulators all only sees uh, the space only. So they, they are more keen to look at how much of uh, the land that you uh, you are opening up and build, build form and the open form. They are not. They are not for. Uh, they are not for judging the structural uh, elements that, that is there in the building. And that is it is one of the main reasons for I mean, who will control that basically. The that's the the maybe that should become part of the building inspector's role. The, the project I'm working on when is on site, and we have regular inspections from building control to make sure everything is being adhered to. That's, that's true. Right. And, yeah. yeah, that's true. That's why in the regulation, uh, the Imran in 2008, that's been given, uh, that there is this provision that's been given a list on rules, under rules, that the, the building should be uh, investigated on various part on, of the construction. It is there on regulation, but as he said, the general say that like there is only two inspectors, so for a million people, mm -hmm. two inspectors is not enough. Let me give you, before I go for the next question, let me give you one good example of building practice in Bangladesh. And this is very, uh, it surprised me as well. Uh, I have worked for um, 
in a couple of projects, which is uh, which is uh, uh, basically a pharmaceutical plant, and pharmaceutical uh, placing a pharmaceutical plant is much more expensive than placing a factory. And what I have realized is that these that they they have practiced the highest level of quality that is main, that can be maintained for for building up these buildings and the environment and. I, I myself have got surprised is that they actually understand not even not only the size of the rooms and the space quality, but also what will be the humidity, what will be the temperature, what will be the airflow, what's the mechanical system. So every detail has, should be taken care of for producing these pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical these uh, these pharmaceutical products. And these are, the, it is an initiative not by the inspectors or from the government or from any other regulatory bodies in the national phase. But it is, uh, it is much more of a key for the owners itself. Why? Because of only one thing is that he knows that his product, if it's not been, if it's not been, um, what you say, permitted by who? World Health Organization, then his product won't be sold outside. So he, he don't even care about uh, the the, pharmac uh, the health division in Bangladesh, whom, whom he knows that he, they can be bribed and all. But he cares about the who regulation. And if he complies with who regulation, he is most of them complying with any other regulations that is there in Europe or in America or in Australia, whatever. So because of that, and also this is a huge, uh, highly invested uh, factories and plant. They don't want that at the end of the day, when everything will be completed, when two guys comes in inspection, they don't want to say no to. And that's why they maintain that level of standards. Now, what we can actually ask that who are the people at international or national level who can actually come and get and set this yes or no or permit this? Maybe even Habitat can do just like who, or may, I don't know. Like They may have these standards of saying that, okay, this factory may run. Even Habitat can say, okay, this uh, government can do that. I don't know. I think can I, I can I just do two short things? I think as he's, he is mentioning, I think there are there are several good practices that is going on. Not everything cannot be bad. Okay. Can be you know, like wrong like that. So if some initiatives can picture good examples and bad examples, okay. then these are these are good things. Second second point is the incidence of Rana Plaza, that that actually is I mean, opened up the deploring situation in terms of planning and regulations and what can happen uh, in high density, uh, especially if I'm talking about the inner city, the whole, whole, whole part of the whole part of Dhaka. If I'm not talking about similar situation, but if there is an earthquake, a similar kind of um, mid, mid or high, high uh, intensity, then we cannot think of what, what can happen. So, so we really need to think about the building regulations and how we can motivate people to to abide by rules. There's actually, uh, I know of, that there is in fact a World Bank project that's being funded now, and I, I can't, I don't know exactly who is taking it forward, um, but perhaps the Asian Disaster Recovery Center. Which is looking particularly at earthquake risks in Dhaka and building and construction safety, and how the different the different bodies, whether it's building inspectors, whether it's planning, uh, whether it's um, you know other actors in, and how they work together on these building safety issues. So it might be something interesting to take up. Yes. Further this discussion. Um, I like the safety pin, and I like using more information. Um, I'm just wondering now, in, in many countries, the data that, uh, that you would produce is what typically building inspectors or work inspectors would, would look at during regular visits to, to factories and so on. Um, so as you say, there is a lack of such inspectors uh, at the moment. So you're, in your project, you will use students, right, to, to do this sort of work. Yeah. yeah. Um, now that's great because they're they can be quite neutral on, uh, on have the knowledge to do this. But compared to inspectors, they would probably lack the power to decide well that this building needs to be closed or to be I improved and so on. I don't as far as giving kind of power in that. I think it's just sure. getting that data to the and say, well, this, this factory has this, 
mm. this is a good practice of bad practice rather than saying, well, now we need to pay for the Sure, sure. Yeah, because I think no. once the data is available, we talk to the bank people, the regulators, or whoever they are. Now, that, so this is my question actually. How, how do you think the data will be used for change to, to actually get some change? Is it by, I don't know, I would imagine taking factory owners to court or developers or um, waking up um, workers that they go on strike? What, what are the possible actions in, in I don't know about managers at all, so that's why I'm curious. I think it, it, it gives us a, what it does is it gives us a scope for social change. So I think that's what it really, the most important thing is to create that platform, whether it's the unions or the workers or the civil servants or whether it's the factory owners themselves who decide to do something about it. I think that's something we've got to leave to sort of open um, decisions. But I think what we would love to do for a time is through the regulation and the government type of, to do the closing, if that was the case. So I think, because that's probably the, the safest way we can do it, I think. If it's, if government is able to then close down factory or whatever it may be, if it's so bad, it's closed down until X number of fire exits or people are sort of reduced to work in. Um, but I, think, I don't think we can enforce what we do with the information. I think we can say to produce information so it's there, it sets a certain standard that allows for other people to sort of continue building that information in the database. Because once it's there, it can be used by any means and any purpose. But I think because it's looking at it from a more socially just perspective, I guess. So we're creating a form of positive change, hopefully, then. Hopefully that information can't really be exploited in a negative way, but now it can be exploited. Yeah. I've been working a little bit with this. Uh, UNESCO has a small group that has worked on the Global Task Force on Building Codes. And they have a number of people who are looking at these issues. And basically what they say is that rather than use the stick, the carrot works better. And so they, there's a basic understanding that, you know, court procedures, regulations are very good, but they're not enough to do it. And really what, what, they, what they say works is having more information about what is safe building, having um, constructors, building professionals that know what is safe, having anyone who's involved in the building industry, whether they're on the owners or the clients or the users, to know what safety is. And this is a sort of way to promote safe building because regulation is, is not enough. Yeah. So carrot versus yeah. They say the carrot is better than the stick. Absolutely, and you have to start somewhere and it's fantastic that you're getting the awareness out there. Right. And even right down to a community level or a layperson level, which you know, they need to be, be aware. But I'm just concerned that um, like like you said that the community, people going into work in the garment factories can't afford to live if they don't go for a day, to, a day of work. So it's not, I don't think it would be hard to, to approach it from a, a bottom up approach. You need to kind of, it still does need to be high up because the guys can't just say, I'm not working because the building's unsafe because the, the boss said, no, you have to work, go in, and they did go in and work. Um, so it's, 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 it's harder really. I mean, it's a higher up approach. You need to kind of get a few key players involved, some big companies, you know, present in front of some of the brands and say you need to pressure the governments. And, and I, sorry, sorry, just to add to that, I also feel that alongside this, there needs to be an arm <laughs> that can't like, tackle some of the corruption that goes on as well, because anybody can be so you, be arm. Arm. <laughs> you can be the arm. Do you know what I mean? All the time. <laughs> It's like you know, you're putting the information out there. You know, I mean, I think that corruption information information should be brought out there as well. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's embarrassing. But the incentives for corruption can be reduced, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. By better design, you know, by better, more skill. Yeah. You know, like you were saying, uh, if they if, if this guy could build this nine plus five number on a plaza, right? Really good design. Right? If he himself would be more so educated in this field. And then he might have to use better design and better, yeah. uh, better architects mm -hmm. you know, to draw better buildings for them and get better people to construct. Uh, so this information needs to be managed and kind of it, it needs to be implemented Definitely. and it needs to be enforced. I mean, you could have all the, as much information necessary to build a safe building and run a safe building. But it's no good if no one will actually take charge of that and enforce it and, and make sure it happens. So, so basically, actually, there are two things 
I think we have to do one thing is, of course, this spin, safety pin, so gathering the information. Another one is to promote safer building and better built environment for to that that's more on a citizen level. So the citizens pers and citizens perspective, they also need to understand what building is and what the safety is and how that each building is is affecting the environment and the inf environment is affecting the building itself. So these are the things that is not well known or or not well educated to the citizen themselves, but these things also needs to be done. I think partly to citizens and to anyone who is, I mean, whether it's someone in the building sector, NGO, government, right. and everyone, right. and what's the and also, sorry, in yeah. case, also, also there is also one thing is that if you look at the business plan of all most of the factories, um, which is uh, which is, which actually produce uh, which is more of an industrial scale, which produces the product in an industrial scale. If you look at the business plan, you will see that the major investment not goes in the building structure; it goes into machineries and equipments, and of course other um, other uh, what you say utility. Utility facilities. So that that is actually the major force. I think something like around seven to eight percent of of an investor's uh, investment goes on those areas. So the building, the cost of constructing the building is is very minimal at all. And so these things is not understood by the new investors who are coming on the fifth. And most of them actually they don't understand this. Uh, the building safety and conservation. That's why uh, the thing that uh, we have one of the Places, actually two of the places that we are going to perform this information is one of the Northley area, which is uh, where the buildings are more retrofitted and the going to place. So the safer the uh, thing is. Another one is at the old Taka city, where uh, where they actually sell the market. Uh, they have to sell the product uh, on the ground floor and make, produce the product on the upper floor. So these are the things that needs to be understood. And, and these, uh, if they come to know that their, their machine, machine cost is much higher, and the building itself. So I don't think there why there would be any reason to have cutting the cutting the bonds just to make a safer building. Okay, so it's we're just past the time and I'd like to close. Um, I will give maybe just a last comment very brief to each of the panelists. Um, I think what we think is sort of the next key steps for us. Um, I think we'll probably sit down and discuss more of the framework that we want to use. But um, I'm out in Bangladesh next month, as is Nazmus, and we've already had a few conversations with other architects and potential programs to help us data collect. So we've had some conversations in my respect, and we're going out here trying to find a really good from September or so, potentially. <coughs> so we're, we're quite keen to really, while the sort of information is still in people's mind, so get out there and get on with it and maybe we'll come back and present in February, March, once we've done the actual work itself. So, so that would be very good. Yeah. Yeah. And are you interested in having a kind of mailing list? Or yeah, that would be useful. I think if people are interested in, in sort of following the how we're getting on, we're good to have contacts. I'm just yeah, I think, look, to subscribe at Ara's website. Uh, if you can come to the mailing list, and we always actually uh, should have mails of what we are doing. Sure. Yeah, it is. And what I'd like to say is that I think we're really negative about uh, the state of Dhaka City. But you know, I, I, I'm really confident. Right? You know, we just went to a phase. Uh, last 20, 30 years, skills level, knowledge, uh, experience of people really <coughs> uh, you know, developing exponentially, right? <coughs> I really believe yeah, there's a lot of problems, political problems and so on. Uh, and sometimes after some this kind of events actually get people to think about things. And I think in a matter of thinking about things, incentivizing, you know, coming up with practical solutions, different levels, you know, so different people, different institutions uh, can play different roles. And I'm really positive that things will really improve. Uh, and then the city will become a real city after all, but demolishing most of it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 just, just, 
achieved the poverty, MDG poverty for two years before. So by, by the end of this year, they are going to attain that level, which is, which is quite a positive thing for us. Um, good. I think, I think this discussion has brought a lot of the, the complexity and the difficulties, both of the large, the much larger issues around, around poverty and, um, and the difficulties of work. Uh, that, that he was saying, and also around regulations and how regulations are applied and not applied, and what are the, the kinds of initiatives that are maybe not regulatory but outside of that that can try to think about how we do safer living. And I think what's happening in Dhaka, we see, I think in Dar es Salaam, we'll see you know, very similar kinds of issues. Um, Maybe not collapse of buildings, but but we'll see. I mean, there's potentially in many cities around the world very similar. So thank you very much for joining us all this evening, and um, thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you.